descending from the tribe of Africa, inspired by the great black leaders. Van Glorious, this is protected by the red, the black, and the green, with a king. identical twins. For example, that one's taller. Uh. And the features are a little different here. I like this one much more. Maybe the artist was different. Anyway, the beard is intact here. And the king is alive. If he was dead, the beard would be curled up. But the king is alive. The beard is straight. The uraeus is intact. And that appears to be more of a cobra symbol right there. And then he has the big old ears. Remember I pointed out that there was a tendency to make the ears look very large, mm -hmm. to give a look of extreme intelligence, and you find it there. And that same consistent Bigfoot kind of thing. Okay, let's go over here, see what else we can find. Look at the hair. Now look at the hair. Look at the hair. It's tied around like that. Now that, I mean, you could just do something on the hair of the Egyptians right there, and I think tell the story of who they were as a people. That's African hair. I see something in the room right now. I wish I could do that with mine, but I can't. Let's go this way. Now this takes us to Dynasty 12. And this is a powerful, powerful warrior king. And his name is Sinusrit III. Dynasty 12 is my favorite dynasty. I just, I love it. Very stable, massive building projects, very powerful women, very powerful men just an era of great stability for about 300 years. And at the center of that is this brother, whose name is Sinusrit III. The Greeks call him Sosostris. And he was identified as a world conqueror. Even in the fragments of the works of Manetho, the Egyptian historian who wrote about the dynasties in the first place, he says that this man went out of Africa. First of all, he conquered deep into Africa, way down into the Nile Valley, according to the story. But he also conquered into Asia and into Europe. And he supposedly conquered even the Caucasus Mountains. And Herodotus, the Greek father of history, writing 1,500 years later, said that he left some of his troops in that region to keep it safe for the Egyptian army to maintain the conquest. And so you have an African colony, a group of black people in the Caucasus Mountains even now. And nobody knows how they got there. And some people think, that they're the descendants of the army of Sinusrit. He's on the throne for about 38 years. And all the images I've seen of him make him look very grim. <laughs> Not somebody necessarily that you want to be a pal with, but a very strong, you know, iron-wheeled kind of human being. Now this stone right here is made of pink granite. And it's one of my favorite building materials and it's very, very hard. You notice the large ears. This crown is from the southern region. It's from Upper Egypt. Remember, the orientation was towards the south. Almost all the great dynastic periods begin in the south and not the north. And there's the Uraeus, a cobra, and you can see the nose is damaged. Now, people ask me that a lot about the facial features of the ancient Egyptians. And I've been pondering that question myself. And there are three answers that we usually have. One is, a group of, I mean, some Egyptians believe that the seed or essence of life was contained in the nose. And if you were to knock off the nose, you would destroy the essence, the nose on the statue. Now, you may think that's very far-fetched, but maybe not. After all, isn't it in modern society that we associate our emotions with our heart? And so the analogy may have been similar to that. Now, I've actually talked to some Africans about it, and they say there's no doubt about it. That happens sometimes. But maybe only a handful of times in Egyptian history. For example, we talk a lot, and I assume we're going to see some pieces, of Agnaten and Hapshetsen. They were not considered legitimate kings later on, and neither was King Tut. There's a place in Egypt, in the middle of Egypt, called Abydos, and Abydos has a series of magnificent temples. And inside one of these temples is a, a wall. 
and it has the record of every king in Egyptian history that occurred up to the time of Ramses the Great. So let me go over that again. At a place called Abydos, you have a temple. On the temple is kind of like a wall of records, and there's a cartouche and a nameplate of every person who was recognized as the king up to that point. And Ramses' father, Seti I, has his son Ramses by the hand, and he's pointing to the wall, these records, as if to say, this is your legacy, and this is your tradition, and this is what you have to look, live up to. But there are certain people who are conspicuously absent. None of the Hiskos kings are in there, and Hapshetza is not in there, and Akhenaten is not in there, and King Tut is not in there. Now, Akhenaten, we talk about him a lot, apparently was considered a really bad guy by some people. He is referred to by later generations of Egyptians as that criminal. He changed the whole social fabric of Egypt. Hapshetzet is regarded as illegitimate because she kind of forged her uh, lineage. She claimed in order to remain, the she became the monarch, the head of state of Egypt, when her husband died very suddenly. And his son, or I guess uh, the next in line, was a little boy. Now they had just undergone this invasion by the Hiskos and they were not going to trust the government of Egypt to an experienced kid. So the, the decision was made that Hapshetzet would reign until this, guy, this kid became old enough to do it himself. And Hapshetzet got into power and said, hey, I'm pretty good at this. This ain't too bad. I don't see why I should get this up even when he does become an adult. And so she claimed that her father wasn't a mortal man that her father was God Amun, who came down from the heavens and impregnated her and gave her the right to divine rule. Later generations of Egyptians didn't buy that. Okay, so anyway, a statue like Hapshetzet's statue might be knocked off. They never even found Agnaten's body. You know, his body was never found. And he was, again, later identified as that criminal. Anyway, so one explanation is the Egyptian priests did it themselves. Another explanation is these statues are mighty old. And if you have a big old nose like mine, and yours, and you fall over and you're made of stone, it's going to suffer some damage. But what we've recently found out is that that was done uh, at the time of Napoleon. Now we know Napoleon damaged the face of the Sphinx with his, ar his artillery. But I talked to one of Sheikh Anta Diop's students and he informed me that Napoleon ordered the officers in the French army to tell all the soldiers to knock the noses off every statue they could find. And they did it so much that they became bored with it. And so there are records of these Egyptians, I mean these um, French soldiers, taking these noses and just throwing them in the Nile River, just for fun. And satellites have flown over the Nile and photographed those pictures of those African noses from those statues in, in the Nile River. And some universities have actually gone and retrieved those noses and put them back on there. So does that make sense? One, the Egyptians believed that seed of life was in the nose, so they would knock off the statue. A certain set of Egyptian priests. Others, it's natural damage. But most of the rest of that was done very deliberately during the time of Napoleon, and apparently this, these are records in a museum in Marseille in the south of France. So there you have it. But the thing about it to me is when the noses are knocked off, they look even more Africoid, not less. <laughs> this is the same king here that you have over there, Sinusrit the third. And he has the same kind of frown, downcast expression. All of his art is like that. And there, again, are the Nimes cloth, the Nimes cloth, and the huge ears, but the very, very somber expression. And there's a better example of the um, Uraeus. And the art changes, too. So, for example, look at the difference between this art, essentially the same stone, and the ones we saw of Amenhotep III over there. I think those are much better pieces of art, plus the, uh, the artist would be different. So let me show you maybe the baddest piece in the whole museum. That's what I thought. Now this says Amenhotep III, or Amenophis III. Now when you find one of these names, these Egyptian names, and it ends in that I-S, that's a Greek name. Like you would have a name like Osiris, or Isis, or Amenophis or Tetmosis, or Ramesses. Those are Greek names, because it ends in that ISL. So whenever possible, we try to use 
what we think are the African myths. Now, this is very interesting because for over a hundred years, this has been identified as a man named Tutmos III. And now they're saying recent opinion favors Amenophis III. So let me, I've already mentioned about Amenhotep III. Let me mention Tutmos III because that's who most of us identify this with. In fact, let's just stand back a little bit so you can really see it. You can't really appreciate it from there. Ah, now look at that head. I mean, this is pink granite too and it's polished. I don't know how much it weighs, but to me, that's really magnificent. The eyes are open. He has a very serene expression, so different from that over there. He has the uraeus in the form of the cobra. The pharaonic beard is broken, and for some reason, the ear is missing on the other side. So he kept his nose, but he lost his ear. <laughs> which, which, which would you rather have? Well, I guess you can lose the ear because you got two ears, only one nose. Um, and he's got the double crown on. Now you don't see that very often. Now I'm, I remember I said that Egyptian um, ancient Kemet is divided into a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. And uh, the northern kingdom had the crown on the bottom that the cobra is in front of. And then um, southern Egypt or upper Egypt had the crown on top. You understand the difference between upper and lower Egypt, right? Okay, because the orientation is different. Upper Egypt would be the south. Lower Egypt is the north, okay? And the one on top with the little ball on top is the crown from the south. The south was always preeminent. The south was always the most important. Always, with one or two exceptions. And so when you see a person wearing the double crown, you know that that brother was on top of it. Because that is the era of great prosperity Africa is at peace. There are no invasions. Nobody is going to school with an empty belly. People have access to education. If you have a grievance, you can actually appeal all the way to the Hayward, to the Pharaoh. He would hear your case. There's a story in Egypt called, the, I think, the, the eloquent peasant. It was just a little peasant, a farmer, somebody who believed he had been wrong, and he took his case all the way. <laughs> before the Pharaoh and appealed and won the case. That idea of justice and harmony is something that's unparalleled in modern times. And that's what these images represent. Is there a reason why they um, make their eyeballs like that? Like what? Well, no um, pupil, no, I, you know, no definition. No, that's a good point. I was doing good. Why are you going to come mess it up with a person like that? I'm just joking. I, I have no idea. <laughs> And I never thought about it. <laughs> okay. Let's look at this one over there. But that's a good question. Sorry, I have to tell you. Uh, this, this, they're saying this may be Amenhotep II. Now, like I pointed out, all of the monarchs, during, we're in Dynasty 18 now, all of them are important. Now, Amenhotep II, you don't hear a whole lot about, but he was a warrior king too, and apparently he was also a great athlete. And you may get some indication of that. The brother does look pretty good. I'll give him that. And he's got the crown from the south. And he's got the uraeus. And this is a different color stone. And now that you mention it, there are no pupils in the eyeball. I never noticed that. I, mean, I don't know exactly why. And he's alive. How do we know that? Even though the beard is missing. How do we know he's alive? Straight. Yeah, but beyond that, anything else? If he's striding forward, and that meant life. And if he were dead, he would be like this, and more than likely his arms would be up like that. So this means life. And I think the official greeting, sometimes we say Hotep, or what, Selassie, or Shalom, or whatever the case may be. They would say <laughs> life, health, strength. Ankh, Ujab, Senef, I think that's how you pronounce it. So this means life. And this is a nice piece. I used to have a vision, it's a bit ambitious now, to have an image, a photograph of every king of Egypt, everyone. And then I decided, well, if I was going to do that, I'd like to have an image of every queen of Egypt. 
and then all the administrators. These are kind of photo archival projects that I think we could engage in. I mean, we could really document our entire history and pass that down to another generation. Now, I'm already thinking about what I'm going to do with my photo archives. I have about, I don't know, between five and 10,000 photographs of African people all over the world. Now, I can't, I don't want you all to put that in my tomb. I want to leave that so that another generation can build on that. When our scholars die, if we don't preserve their archives, then that's a sin. A person spends 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years of their lives doing this kind of work, compiling all kinds of books, all kinds of floppy disks, all kinds of photocopies, all kinds of, you know, um, everything, pictures. And then that person dies, sometimes dies in obscurity. And that person's family has no real appreciation for this. I think you can relate to that. My family for a long time thought I was crazy, and I still think they do, but they don't tell me to my face anymore because I've been doing this for a long time. And so when you pass on, what are we going to do with all these boxes and stuff? You put them in the garage, and they get rained on. You give them away. You put them in a yard sale. And so that person's entire life is scattered. We have to find a better way to preserve our archives. Mm -hmm. And so I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to do with my stuff. And when I think about this era of relative obscurity, that comes to mind. How have, have, any, have any others already preserved any of their archives? Is there some sort of, oh, yeah. of example? Oh, yeah. John Henry Clark's, uh, I think most of his papers, are in the, um, a place called the uh, Schoenberg Library in Harlem. Arthur Schoenberg was a brother born in Cuba, or Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico, I think. And uh, he developed a large collection of books and papers and he sold them to a library in Harlem, New York, and it came to be called the Schoenberg Library, so Dr. Clark's stuff is there. And he sold his library of about 20,000 books to one of the historically black colleges in Atlanta. But from what I gather, they're not taking very good care of those books. But you have other scholars, for example, J.E. Rogers. How many of you know J.E. Rogers? Yeah. One of the best. Rogers was never considered a formal academician. A lot of people compared me to Jay Rogers. I just got this doctorate degree a little while ago, and I didn't ask for it. They said, here, you can take it. Rogers was kind of like that. Rogers spent all of his life doing this research. He never really, I don't know if he ever got a grant, but he loved Africa. In 1930, he went to Ethiopia to cover the coronation of his Imperial Majesty Haile Selassie I. And then in 1930, and Selassie was so impressed, because in order to do it, he stole away aboard a ship. He didn't have any money. He snuck on the ship, before you know it, he was in Ethiopia. And Selassie I was so impressed that he gave him a coordination medal. And Rogers bragged about that his entire life. <laughs> in fact, uh, Selassie I was coordinated in uh, San, a church of St. George in Lalibela, this massive rock church. And then in 1935, Rogers went back to Ethiopia as a war correspondent. He covered the invasion by the Italian fascists. You have in a place called Fisk Library, in a special collection, one of these historically black libraries, who W.B. Du Bois taught, 30 boxes of Roger's stuff, including interviews that he did when he came back to the United States after Ethiopia. There's one article in a paper called the Pittsburgh Courier newspaper where it talks about a, a, a lecture that Rogers had or a meeting. Rogers came back from Ethiopia after about nine months and he gave a presentation, and apparently it was advertised in the paper. The program was supposed to start at 7. By 5 o'clock, there was standing room only. 7,000 people came to see what Roger said. 7,000 African people. That was the interest that Africans in America had about what was going on in Ethiopia. Now, when you pick these, pick these papers up, they crumble in your hands. Nobody's really preserving them. Anybody who is just a, a, a terrible person could go in there and steal that stuff. Now, there's something wrong with that. You know, this is like a, a true library, people say, not a library. We can't let that happen anymore. I'm trying to take some precautions so it doesn't happen to my stuff, because i got a lot of stuff. But if it does happen, I'm going to hold each and every one of you all responsible. They say, Garvey said, look for me in the world when the storm. Look for me late at night, about 3 o'clock in the morning, when you're trying to sleep. And I'm going to say, remember, you let my stuff get tossed out in the rain. By the rain.